Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank, uh, thank each of you for, for coming out today. Uh, my apologies for those of you that didn't uh, get books. Um, our mission as an organization, this is actually an organization, is uh, twofold. Uh, one is to inspire other veterans through these stories uh, to tell their own stories uh, with the conviction and the belief that uh, telling the story and sharing the story uh, of, your, of the impact of war on you and your service time uh, is a crucial step in the healing journey home because war leaves you uh, impacted for the, for the rest of your life. Uh, and I think you will, you will hear stories from these veterans today about that. Our other mission is to educate civilians about the veteran experience, uh, particularly folks just like you, uh, student groups, uh, veteran service providers is another group. Uh, most Americans uh, don't have contact with veterans. Uh, fewer than 1% of our population are in uniform. America has set up a society where we're really very effectively able to isolate ourselves uh, from our veterans, uh, the impact of their experiences on them, uh, and, and our wars. Uh, people tend to get their knowledge or their beliefs about war from either video games or movies. If you talk with a veteran, I'll quickly tell you that's not our experiences. I think you'll hear that today. Um, so we are uh, an organization. Um, the books I gave out to you today are literally the very last boxes of our first printing of over 5,000 copies, uh, which we've distributed in the last year. We've done another printing. Uh, I told Kendall I will ship a couple more boxes to his office. Uh, if any of you uh, did not get a book today, uh, you'd like one, check, check with Kendall in uh, maybe 10 days or next two weeks. Uh, hopefully he'll have books to give them to you. Um, people who read the book, guys, I'll just tell you, a lot of people do uh, shed tears when they read some of these stories. Uh, this is not light reading. Uh, this is not the stories of gallantry and heroism that Americans tend to prefer to hear. Uh, this is uh, the stories uh, right from the veterans' mouths. Um, their, their stories, the stories, as I say, that they need to tell us, uh, not the stories that we want to hear. And if you talk with veterans, they'll say over and over again, I tried to talk and people did not want to hear the story I needed to tell them. But uh, today they're going to tell you the stories they need to tell you and I really appreciate you guys uh, being here to listen. Uh, this is Jeremy Grisham and Jeff Radcliffe, Joe Porter, and Brandon Metalis. Uh, a great diversity uh, of experiences. Uh, we have another veteran, uh, Mike Farnham, uh, who is en route. So the uh, rather beleaguered looking man who's gonna come in shortly is gonna be Mike, uh, and he will also speak. Um, they're gonna read uh, a short excerpt from the story, uh, their story in the book, a couple of paragraphs that they have chosen. Uh, and they may choose to just uh, speak some thoughts that they have. Uh, hopefully they will kind of uh, tell you their branch of service um, and their, uh, their deployment times here. But um, Joe, we were gonna start with you. So Joe Porter, everybody. How are you guys doing? Uh, so I just give you a quick background. Uh, I, I'm from Maine, uh, and basically the only two ways to get out of Maine is to join the military or you get really good grades, you know, go to college, which, uh, and I did not get good grades. So uh, I joined the military and I was, uh, uh, went into the infantry, and I had the option to join the Honor Guard, which is stationed in DC, which is pretty nice place to be stationed. Uh, you know, it's a pretty prestigious unit, um, hard work. Um, and I signed up in 2000, so I'm barely a millennial. Um, I still remember like dial up and getting disconnected, you know, when your friends call you. Um, so yeah, I joined right before 9-11 happened. And this is my story uh, being there in DC at the 
day that the, the Pentagon got hit. So there's a lot of details I won't go into that I recommend you read in the book firsthand, but I'm just gonna kind of give you a firsthand account, like the, the days uh, of us, uh, of our, our job there. Uh, just to lead up to where I'm gonna start here. Uh, after the Pentagon got hit, uh, there really wasn't enough military in DC at the time to, because uh, we went to like full on alert and we needed people pulling security everywhere. Uh, so basically we just didn't sleep for a long time. You know, we we're just pulling security um, at our base at McNair, which is in Southeast DC. And then in uh, Meyer, which is in Virginia. Uh, it's right outside of Arlington, Virginia. If you ever go there, with all the, the grave site, it's a pretty remarkable place to go if you're, like the history there is pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, we were pretty exhausted, but one of the other duties we were tasked with is helping recovery operation at the Pentagon, like going in uh, after everything was, you know, the fires had died out and uh, do recovery. So <clears throat> gonna start here. So one of the things is, uh, I see pieces of plane everywhere, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories, uh, theories that there wasn't a plane, that it was just an explosion, something that was set up, somehow we bombed our own people. Uh, when I hear those lies, I get angry sometimes. I saw the actual remains of people in the plane, and I spent a lot of time digging through the rubble. I saw a lot of bad stuff. When our shift's over, we stumble out of the Pentagon and they spray us off. Uh, we take off our hazmat suits and we're exhausted physically and mentally. The first couple of days, they give us water and sandwiches. They have cots for us to rest on. But in the days after 9-11, there was a big rush of support, we noticed. More and more businesses started setting up camp right outside the area, uh, giving us free stuff. It was a competition. Donald started giving away free hamburgers. And then the next day, Burger King showed up giving away free Whoppers. Uh, the day after that, there was a steak chain lo uh, that gave us uh, sirloin and potato potatoes uh, in between shifts. Free massages to anybody who wanted them, but I never really took them up on the offers. Uh, when we get out of our hazmat suits, we're all sweaty and gross, but people come and rush to give us things. Hey, do you want a sandwich, they ask, a bottle of cold water, energy drink? Um, we, uh, yeah, we didn't have a lot of time to like relax, even though there was like all this stuff offered to us. We were basically there to work, and then when we weren't there, we were sent back to our base, but it was pretty incredible seeing all this happen, you know, uh, being stationed in DC, we, sometimes felt like with so many colleges around, you know, whenever we went out, we kind of felt like the, you know, like people looked down at us and stuff. And uh, like, I remember going to college parties and, you know, sometimes people were like, oh, well, you know, at least we got into college and stuff like that. Um, so it was, you know, it was fun, definitely a fun place to stay. Um, but, uh, yeah, we weren't expecting 9-11 to happen, obviously, and, and the, the job ahead of us. Um, one of the stories that just came to me recently of, you know, there were all kind of senators coming around, shaking hands and stuff like that. People I didn't recognize because I wasn't into politics at that age. Uh, but I remember one day we were standing there, just standing around and waiting and uh, all these like, bright lights are shining down on us and I see a group of huge guys coming towards us and all my friends kind of just turn away and I'm just standing there and, and I see and one of them reaches out and I'm like, oh, that's Jesse Jackson. I shake his hand, his like, hand's huge and he says, thank you for your service and walked away. And so that was pretty cool. I don't see a lot of famous people living in Maine, so unless like there's a Stephen King movie filming or whatever, so yeah. Um, yeah, all right, thank you. So uh, Joe mentioned, so, so Joe, as he said, was, was doing recovery at the Pentagon uh, in, the, in, the, in literally the hours after 9-11, and that was a little over 18 years ago. And I know I'm in a room with some folks, possibly, who were not born 
at that time. I, I can tell you, if you talk with anyone uh, who might have a little gray hair like myself, uh, you remember precisely where you were when you, when you learned about that. That was a, an earth-shaking event uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, and it's, it's one thing I've been interested in is how, how history gets lost and then passed on. And, and for folks that lived it, it's a very different experience for folks that are, uh, you know, weren't, weren't old enough to, to experience it at the time. Um, we're going to have uh, Jeremy Grisham come up here next. Please uh, forgive me because um, I, I have experience speaking in public, but um, I, this is the first time uh, reading an excerpt of, of my recollection of, of my own history, and it's, it's weird. Um, and oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. A um, little closer. Sorry. Um, so my name is Jeremy Grisham. In the book. Um, I'm listed as Emmanuel Wright. Um, I asked uh, to, uh, to use a pseudonym uh, because um, there are details in my story, frankly, that I'm, I'm ashamed of. And, um, and it's hard facing the truth. Um, so with that said, I had initially planned to read one excerpt and then I decided to read something else because, uh, frankly, I lack the courage of, uh, of what I see as being held accountable in front of so many people. Um, and with that said, um, I was a Navy hospital corpsman. I joined in 1993. I was a, um, I was a high school dad. And, and so with that, I, I was like, I need a future. I need to you know, be able to raise my children. And so I joined the Navy. Um, and I spent most of my career working with CB units, um, uh, and I'm just going to use a, it's like a slang, uh, POG, uh, Marine Corps units, uh, persons other than grunts, and in naval hospitals. And in 2002, um, I was transferred to um, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines out of Camp Pendleton, California. Um, and uh, that's where, I, uh, that's the unit I deployed with to, to Iraq in 2000, 2003 during the invasion. Um, this, ex it, this uh, what I'm going to read, um, is uh, happened just outside of a town called N, N. Numenaya. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's off the Tigris River, and um, we were uh, we were pushing pushing up us before we were in Baghdad, and uh, we're just pushing up in a big convoy, and uh, just kind of doing what we wanted to do, and uh, I was in the last in the last track. A track is like this amphibious assault vehicle sort of thing. It's like a tank, with, except for a turret, it has like a, a 50 caliber machine gun and then like a grenade launcher, you know? And um, so we're, we're in this, we called it a mobile ambulance. And uh, cause it was me, my doc, and three other corpsmen. Um, we're the last uh, vehicle in, in, in the uh, convoy and I'm looking out the back little window, uh, porthole hatch or whatever. And I see this truck, it's, I don't know, maybe two or three football fields back, and it's getting a little bit closer. It's this white truck, it's kind of like every truck you see in, in Iraq, it seems. And um, all of a sudden, it swerves off the side of the road. And I'm gonna start reading now, sorry, I was, I'm gonna start going off in the weeds. Um, a father is driving a pickup truck full of people. He gets too close to the convoy, and the Marine shoots. Um, I'm not sure which Marine. He was a really good shot, though. Uh, the Marine is following orders by shooting, and the Marine is shooting because he will do anything to protect his brother Marines. Uh, really, it was like a, an order, you know, no warning shots. Um, and so if people got too close and they threatened, you know, our security, and so it was just part of what, what they did. Um, it was a good shot. The shot goes directly through the driver's throat. It kills him instantly. The truck veers off the road and crashes several feet into the field below. And it was really strange because when I'm watching this truck, it just, it's almost like it floats. It just kind of floats down into this field of wheat or whatever the crop was. And it just stops. 
Uh, we stop and I go to treat the occupants. Uh, the body of the driver is, is laying out on the ground. Um, his body is laying in mud and uh, the blood from him is, is intermixing with the mud. The passenger um, in, the, you know, in the cab, the passenger, his face is cut up from uh, the shattered windshield and I start sewing him up. Uh, the people who had been in, in the bed of the truck, um, uh, you know, farm hands and that sort of thing, um, and we had taken them up to the top onto, onto the road where we had them sit down in the circle. Um, uh, there's a young boy, there's a, uh, after I finish sewing this man's face, I go up to see other, to check on the other people, and there's this young boy um, among them. Uh, one of the Iraqis uh, speaks English, and he says, you know, like, what's going on? Um, he asked, how's the driver? And I didn't know how to speak English at that point, and I just, um, I just shook my head. And um, uh, the young boy is, is sitting right next to him, and um, and as soon as he understands that, 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 that uh, As soon as he understands what happens, his his face contorts into a grimace. And he wept. The Iraqi that spoke English told me that um, that the driver was his father. Forgive me. The driver was his father, and um, that morning, uh, he had his sister, uh, the family, the mother, father, uh, brother, and sister. Um, the sister, the daughter, um, was begging the father not to leave. And um, they, I mean, it's a war, but they still have to, you know, uh, feed their family, so he, he's like, uh, daughter says, so asked them not to leave repeatedly, and he said, oh, we're going to go anyway, and they went, and, uh, and he died there in the mud. And what's not in the book is how people, um, my people, uh, celebrated the shock, the accuracy, the lethal accuracy of, of that Marine's um, intent, uh, another corpsman sticking his finger in, in, the, in the dead man's throat. And the fact that um, we didn't have the resources to clean up our mess, and we left them there without, without a means of communication, or a, a transportation, or a, a way to communicate with the family. And we left our, them there on the side of the road so that they could carry them home. And as our, our, our convoy started on again, that's exactly what they did. They picked them up and they went the direction opposite of where they're heading initially. I just want to say that um, I just want to say that Iraqi, the Iraqi people are some of the most beautiful people I've ever known. And I, I agree completely that uh, veterans, um, veterans' perspectives are important because these are perspectives of our community. Um, it's my hope that we don't forget that uh, the issue is bigger than veterans, and there's people whose families have been broken, people displaced from, them home, from their homes, and people, too many people who are dead, and we don't even know how many they are because it's just unimaginable because of this war. I think that's all I need to say. Thank you. Um, 
So uh, we, we have been, uh, we've done, I don't know, 15 or 20 events. This is uh, the first uh, event Jeremy has uh, come to, and uh, I think you can kind of understand the enormous courage uh, took, it takes to come in and share a story uh, with, with folks. Uh, um, you realize very privileged uh, to get to be with Jeremy. Um, he's, he's really an extraordinary, I can tell you, because I've gotten to know him, and he's an, just an extraordinary individual because uh, he, he's had to work through deep, deep pain and grief, and uh, people of character can turn that into, into wisdom. Uh, but, but the pain and the grief uh, nev never go away. Uh, we thank you Brother, for coming. Uh, Jeff, you want to come on up? Jeff, Jeff Radcliffe. Uh, my name is Jeff Radcliffe. Uh, I grew up here in Washington, up in Linwood. Um, I joined the Navy when I was 17. Um, I was a corpsman, like Jeremy, um, basically a corpsman. Uh, we're like a, a doc. Um, we do medical stuff uh, for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, so you can work on ships, work in hospitals, or uh, be a greenside corpsman and go with the Marine Corps, or, uh, or CBs and stuff like that and get deployed uh, over to the Middle East or wherever there's a war zone going on. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit. Um, if you got a book and you wanna follow along, I'm going to start on page 160, um, and I'll just get right into it. We're running nonstop convoys to Marja, 16 gun trucks accompanying loads of lumber and sandbags and HESCO barriers. HESCO barriers are eight foot tall, chain link cages link lined with canvas. The Marines assemble the HESCOs, each one flush against the other, and fill them with earth and rock. They're building the defensive perimeter for a Marine fire base in Marja. Most of the world's opium flows out of Marja. It's the heroin center of the universe. The Marines are going to flush the Taliban from the area and convince the farmers to plant mung beans, red radishes, alfalfa, watermelon, and corn. They want the farmers to plant these instead of opium poppies. We've been awake for four days straight, grabbing 30 minutes of sleep when and where we can. We drive two hours from Camp Leatherneck to Marja, unload HESCO barriers, lumber, and Marines, and turn around. We drive by kids and farmers and donkeys. We drive by brightly painted Afghan trucks and the silent rust, rusting hulks of shattered Russian tanks. We drive by the irrigation canals that line the roads in and around Marja, smelling the foul green water. A film of scum floats on the surface. For four days, we don't stop for anything other than gas. It's 4 a.m., it's pitch black, except for the Milky Way blazing overhead. Our six-wheeled MRAP truck creeps along at 15 miles an hour. Nobody's wearing their seatbelts, nobody's wearing their helmets. I'm asleep like most everybody else, but if I were awake, I'd hear our turret gunner shouting. He's hollering at the top of his lungs at Lance Corporal Ely. Ely's supposed to be driving the MRAP, but Ely's fallen asleep at the wheel. Our turret gunner up top watches us slowly angle off the road towards the deep, fetid canal. Ely's a tall, skinny black kid whose white teeth are always showing. He has a perpetual smile. He's the funniest guy in the truck. He's constantly cracking jokes and making us laugh. Ely. Ely, wake the fuck up, man. Ely, wake the fuck up. But Ely has been lulled by the quiet night and the monotony, sorry. monotony of the road and the fatigue of round-the-clock operations. He doesn't wake up. The front tire of the MRAP leaves the road and heads toward the dark water of the canal. The second tire leaves the road and down the steep bank. When the MRAP is on the cusp of rolling over, the gunner jumps down in the cabin. I wake up and realize I'm floating in warm water. My ears are filled with liquid, and the world mediated with aqueous sounds of sloshing and creaking. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know shit. The only thing I know is I'm underwater. I figure out the MRAP's upside down, and I stand up. Me and the two guys in the back are up to our armpits in warm, slimy water that smells like human shit and dead animals. You'd think it'd be a shock to wake up underwater, but no. Oh, I gotta get out, you think blatant, blandly. Commence MRAP emergency egress procedure. That's all. You just deal with it like it's normal. A lot of things become normal. The first time you get shot at, you get real excited. Your heart hammers, no way I'm getting out of the truck, you think, no fucking way. But you get shot at again and again and again. After the fourth or fifth time someone shoots at you, well, I gotta pee. I'm getting out of the truck, so tell that guy not to shoot me. Um, it's really interesting going on a deployment, being 19, 20, 21 years old, and, uh, and just the things you go through that 
are totally not normal, um, and they just become like nothing to you. Um, traumatic experiences or seeing horrible things or being a part of horrible things, and it's just, it becomes so normal that you don't even think about it. And then later on in life, sit, whenever I sit down and read the book or talk to other veterans and tell stories and just kind of sit around and bullshit around a fire drinking beers, I don't even feel like I'm talking about myself. And uh, it's just a whole, it's a whole different life, a whole another world away. And uh, it's just interesting to see how that affects you as you continue to age and grow up and deal with this stuff after the fact. So, thanks. And I, I don't know if Jeff told you, but the, he, he did three deployments uh, to Afghanistan, uh, three deployments. Uh, first two, if my memory serves, were nine, nine days apart, and uh, then uh, as, as a corpsman. Um, uh, anyway, his, his story, um, titled appropriately enough, tell that guy not to shoot me uh, in there here. Um, let's see, uh, Brandon? And until uh, until Mike rolls in, we're going to have you come up here, brother. Brandon Metalis. Why, thank you. Um, so, as Jeb said, my name is Brandon Metalis. I enlisted in the Marine Corps a um, couple months after 9/11. Uh, I was playing college soccer at the time, and um, just felt I was actually recovering from a concussion and so the whole week that it happened was kind of a blur and, and by Friday after uh, the towers fell on Tuesday things kind of started to fall in place in my mind and I was kind of beginning to understand the gravity of the situation and with that understanding I also felt a calling uh, to do something bigger to be a part of something bigger than just myself and up until that point, I was 100% focused on soccer. I missed my high school graduation to go to a soccer tournament. Uh, my mom still gives me a hard time about that. But, um, so yeah, soccer was my whole life. And then, then the military became a huge part of my life uh, while being in the Marine Corps. Um, so I deployed, uh, interesting circumstances, but I, I ended up deploying uh, in 2004, and we landed in Iraq on September 11th of 2004. And uh, after about a week, I was handpicked out of my unit to fly down to Kuwait and uh, run an airport down there. So I spent most of my deployment in Kuwait um, running an airport. And my airport just happened to be where every military member uh, came in and out of that airport. So whether they're coming into country to start their deployment or leaving country uh, to go home, at the end of their deployment, they came through us. And that included uh, both living military members and military members who were killed in combat. So I ended up carrying 226 Marines and sailors who were killed in combat, their flag draped caskets or their body bags on stretchers, um, sometimes having to go back in the morgue and help the, the Army guys do, do their thing as mortuary affairs uh, people. So that's just providing a little bit of a context to, to what I did uh, in the military. And now I will read you a short excerpt from the end of my chapter and then the end of my where they're at now section before I kind of just talk a little bit, all right? Uh, my mom was long asleep up in Seattle, 200 miles away when I called her. It was after one in the morning. The phone rang and rang, and then she answered and said, hello, what's going on, Brandon? There was no hiding the trembling in my voice. I told her that I was struggling, bad. I told her that I wasn't sure that I was gonna make it through the night. She said that she was getting her keys and coat and that she was coming to get me. She was driving to Portland to take me to the VA right then, in the middle of the night. She'd be, in, she'd be at my apartment before dawn. She was on her way. But the sound of her voice brought me back to somewhere I could hold on. T talking, with her, talking to her took me off the metaphorical ledge, at least for the moment. I told her then 
that I would be okay for the rest of the night. And she convinced me to go talk to somebody for the first time. And I did. I woke up the next morning and drove straight to Seattle and met her at the VA emergency room and had my first psych appointment. That was my path. That was my crossroads. She saved my life that night. If that was the one thing she was put on this earth to do, I'm still here because of it. At the time, I didn't believe that I would see my 25th birthday. And I turned 37 this year in August. Thank you. So now uh, the last few paragraphs of my where they're at now uh, submission. Telling my story and talking about these things is not an easy task. I have found it increasingly difficult to separate the emotion from the process of telling the story. Unloading everything that first time with Jeb face to face, it was powerful. It was meaningful, but it was also difficult. It brought a lot of things to the surface that I had unconsciously, that I had con consciously and unconsciously suppressed for a long time. Vulnerability is scary, but it's also liberating. I gave a keynote speech to a large audience at a high school one year. It was terrifying, but you can see that when it's over, you're okay. The world is still spinning, the sun is still rising in the east and setting in the west, and you still have a purpose. You don't have to be afraid of your past. Everyone has their own unique story, and I don't understand how mine can affect others in a meaningful way. I know it does, but I still, still can't fully grasp why. These memories of things that I've done and seen and experienced, they almost ended me, <clears throat> multiple times. Part of me does not understand how those same things also have the power to save a life or to positively affect change in another human being who doesn't know me. But the fact is, if indeed my story does have the power to save a life or change a life for the better, <clears throat> and if I can help just one person by talking about my struggles, my experiences, my demons, and my ascending path to success and happiness and joy, then it's all worth it. The pain of telling the stories and the pain of remembering the sights and sounds and smells and moments, it's all worth it. I'm not done. I promise. So it's really interesting. Um, the, the paper that I was reading from in here, I made a note in it last year here at Highline. Uh, when we were when we were given a talk, and it was I made that note because it just popped in my head, and a couple weeks before I wrote it, I had met uh, a woman at uh, a festival type thing, um, and got to talking about my story a little bit, and then she just flat out asked me, and it says right here, talk about being asked if I was a racist. Welcome to the heavy part of the talk. You thought the other stuff was, was heavy. Um, I'd never been asked that before, before that moment. And I'd never really put a whole lot of thought into it. Um, because you go through your training, you are taught in that training and indoctrinated in that training that these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. These are who you want to protect and these are the enemy. So my answer to her question only took about three seconds, but there was probably 10 years worth of mental processing going on in that three seconds. And my answer was flat out, yes, I was. I had to be, right? Um, unfortunately, I had to be. And so when you hear talks about, uh, or the words being spoken about that seems like a different life, doesn't even t think, doesn't even sound or feel like I'm talking about my story or reading about my experiences. I feel the exact same thing. I tell people all the time that it's like I watch this movie multiple times and it's ingrained in my head, but it, it wasn't a movie, it was real life experience. And I was 100% for a number of years prejudiced towards a certain type of people. And I just wanna express to you 
how archaic that way of living life is. That, those times are done. You, you, cannot, you cannot judge people by their religious beliefs, by their skin color, by their sexual orientation, by their gender identity. Because at the end of the day, we're all part of the same tribe. Right? And we're all trying to make it through this life as best as we can. And we have to keep doing that. And we're not going to be able to do that alone. So if you get nothing else from your journey in life today, I hope it's just, I, ho I hope you take some time to reflect on how you treat people. Right? How, you, how you treat the stranger on the street and how you treat your best friend. Are they different? Are, do you, are you different to those people? And if you are, ask yourself why. What about that person on the street that you know nothing about makes you treat them poorly compared to your best friend or your favorite family member that you know everything about? That's what's going to help change this world. Approaching your daily life and every interaction that you have with people as if it's the last time you're going to see your best friend. Show them love. Show them respect. Show them courtesy. Offer to help. Reach out a hand. You never know if you're going to be the person like my mother was that saves that person's life that day. Because I guarantee you every single day on this campus, you cross paths with somebody who is at the end of their rope, who's on that ledge that I was on, that most of us veterans have at least flirted with in our heads, if not actually stood there. And your ability to save that person's life could be as simple as a smile, could be as simple as a bottle of water, could be as simple as, are you doing all right? It's not that difficult, but it, it is a choice. I had to make a choice. I had to leave my old way of, of thinking and looking at people far behind in my past. And while I may not be proud of that, who I was at that time, during that time of my life, I'm damn sure proud of the path that I have consciously taken to flip that script. It's a choice. It's a difficult one at times because Everybody's raised differently. I was born in 1982 to a first-generation Greek-American father and a wonderful mother who put up with that Greek-American father, <laughs> right? But certain, certain words were okay to use in the household. Certain ways of talking about certain people were okay to use in the household. That was just how I grew up, right? But that's not how you have to continue growing up. Thank you. Uh, Brandon uh, had referenced the uh, where they're at now section. Um, his, his story is the, is the last story in the book, and then after that is, is where they're at now. So it's an update. There, there are 18 stories in this book, and it's, uh, these are updates. Um, of each of the each of the individuals you've read about, uh, kind of where they're at now, um, it also includes a, a photo of their of their service time, and um, and one thing you might notice seeing Brandon now and looking at his photo back then is what a young, very young man uh, he was. In fact, they they all were at that time. You look at photos and you realize we send very young people to war, and uh, they come home not young people at all. Philip Caputo, who wrote a phenomenal book called Rumor of War about his time 1965 in Vietnam, said, when I came home, I was older than my father, or at least I felt that way uh, psychically here. Um, Brandon also had the courage to talk about uh, suicide uh, and, and veterans. Some of you may know the number 22 that's out there, uh, the number of veteran suicides a day, and I kind of feel that's really one of the highest callings of the book is to inspire other folks, uh, other veterans, to tell their story, and that's a that's a way to try to make themselves feel whole uh, and working through uh, almost universal guilt for simply being alive when you know other people who are not. Uh, that's almost a universal attribute aspect of being a veteran. 
Uh, Brandon was on uh, a podcast called This Is War uh, who, and related his experience. Uh, a young man, a young veteran listened to that and, and was inspired to type up his own story. Did you read his story? Uh, Ryan Miles, I, wanna, I think so. Um, interestingly, he titled, uh, the young man who wrote his story up, he titled it, Don't Thank Me For My Service. That was the title he put on his thousands of words, don't thank me for my service, which um, my experience with uh, certainly veterans of the 9-11 generation is uh, they find that a very awkward uh, uh, encounter to have people want to thank them. And that might be something uh, you would like to ask them. We're gonna open it up to Q&A, guys. You're cool with that? Um, is that mic working there? Nope, nope. What, I know we've got these mics here. I was also thinking I could walk around for people that are uh, maybe too shy to walk on up. Um, and uh, see if anybody would like to uh, ask uh, Jeremy, Jeff, uh, Joe, or Brandon um, some question you've got or some comment. Uh, yeah. What? Yeah, they are. I'm gonna I'm gonna carry this one up to you. Hi, my name is Noel Pulowski. I uh, grew up a dependent of a dad who served 26 years, and first of all, he didn't like to be thanked for his service either. It's kind of just what you go out and do. It's not something that you. It's a little extra. So I uh, kind of grew up in the mode that more kind of like your mother than anything else, it was, it was different seeing him leave than seeing him come back being nine years old and then being 11 years old and having a different person walk through the door. And uh, what I wanted to ask about was, it didn't really get hard for our family until after he retired. He had 26 years of experience, but he didn't have a bachelor's degree or a high school diploma. So, it was more difficult dealing with your experience and then coming back and feeling like you're worthless to society. So I was wondering if any of you struggle with finding a career after you uh, left the service and how you got through that personally. I'm uh, 38 now and I'm just now basically starting my career as a graphic designer. <laughs> So it's, yeah, I definitely struggled uh, like trying to find my way. You know, like I was always into art, but for some reason, you know, you, doing it as a career didn't strike me until late, later in my life, and I I realized what I really love to do. And when you come out of the army, depending on your MOS or your job, I don't know what your dad did, but you know, if you're 11 Bravo like me, it's it's a uh, you know infantry, uh, you basically have like security job or the police. And if you're not into either of those things, then you're starting from square one, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a struggle for a lot of people. I got out of the Navy when I was 23 um, and doing medical stuff in the Navy. Um, I got out of the Navy with, without even like a CPR card. Um, with no clue what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I worked a lot of, just pardon my language, bullshit jobs for minimum wage, um, doing security guard work, mowing people's lawns. And uh, you just, it's hard to fit back in. And uh, you, don't, you don't wanna go to school and get an education because you're way older than everyone else you're going to school with. And you're just, you're just in a weird place. Um, I ended up living in my car for almost a year down in the desert in Arizona. Um, and I'm turning 30 this year, and I'm I finally just starting to get going on a real career uh, last year, you know, making some good money and have insurance finally and a little bit of money saved. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough when you get out trying to figure out what you want to do and how to get there, for sure. Um, I just want to say, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the toughest jobs in the military is that, that of the family member, and so, I just want to, 
you know, raise my hand to you uh, and your family for, for your uh, resilience and, and uh, everything that you've been through. One other thing he, he talked about was um, the, the person who goes to war is not the same one who comes, comes back from war and almost a universal uh, experience for wives and, and families. Did any of you guys want to comment on that part of what he said? Um, coming back, people always tell you you're different or your parents or your friends that you used to hang out with in high school. Um, and it's hard to believe and it's hard to listen to. And you, I don't, Me personally at least, I got angry at people trying to tell me I was different or I'd changed. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's just being young and stupid, but growing up a little bit, I'm, I definitely came back a different person and it's, it's hard to admit that to yourself um, when you come back and there's a lot of guilt and shame associated with it, but um, Looking back, I'm, I'm not proud of the person that I came back as and the way I treated other people or the way I acted out in public. Um, but I, you, you definitely 100% come back different and it's, it takes a long time to accept that and, and become a normal person and try to fit back in again. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things my story touches on is like mental health and, and kind of dealing with that and kind of how underprepared the VA is with dealing with mental health and uh, you know if there's one thing I would say from my story if you got read it um, what you would get out of it is definitely like try to uh, you know if you're if you're struggling with anything try to get some help like right away because it, it definitely like changed turned my life around when I finally like saw a therapist and kind of realized like some of like my learning disabilities and you know issues that I struggled with for so long and also stuff from the military and you know other things in my life and and uh, unfortunately veterans don't have much help in, at the VA like there'll be some groups you can visit but as far as like one-on-one -on -one help having a therapist they'll is very very limited and it's like you would think that would be the, the number one thing like priority people would put, you know, when they talk about veterans, you know, politicians and everything, uh, especially with like 22, you know, suicides a day, uh, uh, instead of talking about privatizing the VA and all this other stuff, it's like, can we just get mental health resources and start from there? And, uh, and yeah, it would do people like your dad wonders, you know, cause like, it's, it's almost like, uh, like a, re a retiring um, like athlete who's just like spent his whole life like working towards being an athlete and like it's just like that in the military when you get out you're thinking everything is with thinking about your brothers people around you your job is all military and uh, and then you're thrown into the civilian world which you only like get a glimpse of every now and then and you're just kind of like feel like you're abandoned uh, and uh, if you don't have a great support network, or even if you do, it's, it's a big struggle, so. Yeah, definitely if you know any veterans out there. And, and a, another thing is a lot of veterans sometimes close off from their families, and it's not always on purpose, you know, it's like, uh, so if you know anybody like that, you know, sometimes reaching out is hard, but uh, try, to, try to do it. So. I'll, I'll bring the mic up for you. Thank you for asking a question. Um, I was just wondering if, um, for someone that is thinking possibly about going into the military after high school, um, is that something that you like? I don't know if you like. I don't know if recommend is the right word, but like, um, think would be like um, a possible like good choice for them, especially career wise. Career wise, and if so, what advice would you give them? Like going into just uh, jo like going to like National Guard or the military or Army or going into that career choice after high school. It's funny we were actually kind of just had a off the cuff conversation before any of y'all arrived. Um, I, I think there are amazing benefits, and there are so amazing 
bullet points in the, in the plus column, and there's some, definitely some uh, negative column bullet points as well. My recommendation, and this is just for me, is to speak with veterans, right? Speak about, you know, and, and try and get a diverse group of veterans, you know, whether it's a female from the Army, a male from the Marine Corps, or this person that was in infantry, this person that was logistics, because recruiters, and pardon me if there's any recruiters or family of recruiters in here, recruiters are, are salesmen, right? They have, they have quotas, they have goals to meet, they, and that comes down from much higher up. Um, so they're, they tend to, mine didn't. I had a, a personal like friendship with mine prior to, but they, they fluff stuff up, right? And they, and they try and make it sound like everything is brilliant and it's just like in this movie and it's this, that, or the other. And they'll play to the, the cues that you're giving them, right? I want to do this, oh, okay, let me tell you about how awesome that is. Um, so I think it's a brilliant path for, for a lot of people, you know, you know, based on whatever their upbringing or family situation or lack thereof, right? Um, it, it definitely has been an avenue for people to get out of the struggle and start a path towards you know, happiness, success, joy, whatever. And it's also been the opposite for people. So I think getting their firsthand experience is so much more valuable than just going into a recruiting office and saying, what can you offer me? Oh, a $10,000 signing bonus, sweet. And yeah, that's spread out over two paychecks a month for the next six years. Yeah. So you get $43 extra a month in that $10,000 and you gotta pay taxes on it. So it, there's a lot of fluff, but I think veterans like, like us, and other people you may know are in your network, I think they'll give you the honest feedback and the honest account of, of what, it, what it's going to be like because it's vastly different than the recruiting videos. Would, would you guys each be willing to talk? To, I think we're gonna get a diversity of answers on that one, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah I just I would say, you know, you're reading these stories and uh, a lot of them are very hard to, to, to read, but this, I would, after everything, I would definitely recommend it if you're thinking about it. Like if you're in that mindset where you are really interested in it, I, you know, and you definitely put research into it, you know, uh, not just rely on recruiters to get all the information, and you know, learn what kind of benefits you get, and really, the benefits as a young as a young person, I didn't even think about like the healthcare benefits that I do have and the college I was paid for. Um, you know, looking back, I definitely think it was worth it, and you know obviously all the friends I, I met and, and stuff. So if there's a job, you know, if you're looking, if it's available in the military, if it's uh, yeah, something that you think, you know, you could, you could do. Um, also, if you finish college and join the military, sometimes you get a higher rank, so sometimes that's a better way to do it, and then they pay for your college. So just look at the options available, that's all I say. Um, you asked us if we would recommend it, my, my personal answer. I tell everyone I know who has kids that are thinking about it or they're thinking about it, I tell them not to. Um, there's a reason that recruiters and the military target high schoolers and 19, 20, 21 year olds, because we've all been that age, we all thought we had the world figured out and we knew how things worked and, and we were just, you know, we had, we had life figured out and uh, as you get older, you, you start to realize that maybe you didn't know everything Maybe you got used, maybe you got manipulated. Um, and uh, per personally for me, I, I have no pride in the fact that I was in the military. Um, it's nothing but, but shame and disgust with things that I was a part of. Um, things that I've personally done and things that were done with a group I was associated with. Um, but again, everybody comes out of it with a different experience. Um, the only advice I guess I would give is try to try to get some some civilian world real life experience b before you make that decision. There are good benefits to being in the military, um, but just like everything else, you know, there's got to be a balance. If if there's some really good things, there's probably some really terrible things too. Um, I think uh, I think I. Of two minds of joining the military. I think if uh, I have two, three children, one on the way, uh, one's 25, one's 21, one's four. 
And um, I had thought with my daughters, I thought, well, maybe it would be good for them to join the military and, and uh, you know, they would learn some good skills and get strengthened up and that, that sort of thing. Um, they didn't need the military to learn their strengths and resilience. Um, and now I'm thinking about my son, who's four, and um, I'm thinking I would tell him no. Um, because I think that there are so many other ways to serve our country and our community. Um, but it's a deeply personal choice, and if you do join, um, I think that you'll do fantastic. Um, but I, I think that if you're looking to serve the community, there's like a gajillion different ways to do that, and I think they're just as important as, as a military option would be. Thank you, guys. Do we have, uh, we still have, we have a little more time. Is anybody else have a question you'd like to ask? Any other guys? Yes, yeah, let me give you the mic. Uh, has your experience heavily influenced your political views since serving? And I'm not necessarily looking for you to declare your political views or more just kind of that process and how you were influenced by your service. Uh, uh, yes, yes and no. I mean, uh, uh, serving in the helping profession, I've always been fairly liberally, liberally minded. Um, but uh, uh, my experience in the military has definitely um, uh, kind of emboldened my perspectives as far as uh, what it means to, to, what social justice really means and what human rights means and that sort of thing. And, um, so yes, it has. Yes and no. It strengthened my perspectives. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's affected my political views. Um, kind of to touch on what Brandon was talking about earlier, you get so indoctrinated and surrounded by this culture of uh, maybe not like hatred, but you know, these people are the enemy, these people are bad, kill, kill, kill. Um, and uh, being that age in that environment, um, formed some, some pretty strong, biased, personal and political opinions that were, after growing up a little bit, you know, not, not the healthiest to have. Um, I've always been fairly conservative, I, I, I still am, but uh, there's, I don't support either one of these wars. Um, I don't support any, any other wars. Um, there's, I, I get it, there's, there's a need for self-defense and, and defending democracy and all of that, but I, I, I can't think of any more rights that I have now. Um, I feel like I have less rights now than I do, or than I did before I went to war or before my friends went to war and didn't come back. Um, so it's, it's affected my political views a lot. Um, yeah. Um. I mean, it definitely got me into politics after I got out, like, you know, when my 20s, wasn't really thinking too much about, you know, who I was voting for or anything. Uh, I'll just say that I, yeah, to me, it, I just recently, the past couple of years, I just got sick of politicians using veterans as a political tool and decided to finally just start speaking out on my own as a veteran um, and just kind of, yeah making my voice heard on my own. So, yeah. For me, um, big part of <clears throat> my distaste for certain aspects of our political system happened when we were deployed and it was an election, a presidential election year in 2004. Um, and, uh, we, we were unable to get our absentee ballots in time to vote. So having been sent to the Middle East, being in the Middle East during an election cycle and not having the means to vote, quite frankly, really pissed a lot of us off. Um, and so for me, I guess if, if, if anything has evolved within my view of politics, it's, it's more my approach to voting. I, I do not affiliate with any party, I, I look at the ballot, I research both sides of the ballot or the multiple candidates on the ballot and I make the best decision for myself and how I view 
this whole experience of life. Um, while also understanding that, especially in Washington State, sometimes my views or my vote has absolutely no meaning, right? Just because of how, you know, just the, the political breakdown of the state, um, and the party affiliation breakdown of the state. So sometimes I'm conservative, sometimes I'm more liberal, and more, more often than not, honestly, my, my party of choice is just be a good person <laughs> because at the end of the day, the stuff at the highest level doesn't really, I don't have any control over that, much like I didn't have control over my ability to vote in 2004, and so just take it as it comes for me. Oh, any, anybody else? Would, uh, great. Thank you. I was wondering if you, with it being a volunteer army, do you think it would be more beneficial to institute the draft where people would, um, do you think it would end the wars quicker because more people would be more in tune to what's going on and care? Or do you think um, having the volunteer army is because the people who want to be there are there? Um. I'm just going to say, everybody I know in the military is glad that it's a volunteer, you know, army or navy or whatever, uh, because, yeah, it's, it's hard enough getting people, you know, from that civilian into becoming a soldier. Uh, I can't imagine drafting people in who have no desire to do it, you know. Um, and as much as some people can benefit from structure, that's not necessarily how they'll learn, you know, like discipline and uh, camaraderie and all that, so, yeah. I used to be a huge supporter of like mandatory military service after high school. Um, but the, the whole purpose and intent of our military is to defend our, our freedom. And if you're gonna force people to go to war and die and kill, that destroys the whole point of, of freedom, that people have the right and the freedom to choose. Um, so I, I think it's a good thing that it's, it's volunteer. Um, yeah, I think, I think it should stay volunteer. Um, uh, I'm against uh, uh, forced servitude, but if we did something like that, uh, I w it would be really interesting to see if, uh, if, uh, if, we made it mandatory to serve, you know, the the country in other ways uh, for like a year or two. Uh, uh, hear this up, man. Um, uh, yeah, so not just the military. I think people kind of like focus on military as the only way to serve, but there's so many different ways. And if we were to do something like that, then it would be cool to see how creative we could be with uh, service. <laughs>